Chains, Chapter 41. When Madam woke the next morn, her first, com uh, her first command was for hot scones. Her second was that the seamstress must be fetched immediately. The British commandant was throwing a ball in honor of Queen Charlotte's birthday for the ten, year ten days' time. Uh, Madam required a new gown for such an occasion, perhaps two. I learned of all of this while I returned from the market with a fresh kilt chicken. Hannah, who had taken over as boss lady job from Sarah after the baby was born, was preparing a cherry pie. Mary sat by the window, mending one of Madam's skirts. The notion of a ball for a queen confuddled me. That's a long voyage for a celebration, I said. Hannah laughed. No, you ninny. The queen isn't coming. How could she? She's got ten children to take care of, plus all of them castles. Eleven, added Mary. She popped out a new one last spring. Even though the queen can't come, the officers always hold a ball in her honor, Hannah said as she rolled out the pie dough. Gives them a good excuse to eat too much and drink too much and make proper fools of themselves while dancing. I pulled out the feather bag and, the, and a basin, and Madame Lockton is attending. The colonel will be her escort. Mary bit her thread in two. All the rich folks will be there. I ripped a handful of feathers from the chicken and stuffed them into the bag. Does Madame require anything of us? Not yet, Hannah said, carefully laying the dough in the, in the pie plate. That will change, no doubt. I've seen the queen herself, you know, Mary said, squinting at the stitches. With your own eyes, Hannah asked. I don't believe you. Well, I seen her carriage, and she was in it, the backside of the carriage, mind. I actually, the backside of the troops guarding the backside of the ca carriage, but I saw the wheels bend down to do it. She threaded the needle. Bet you don't know her name. Her Majesty, said Hannah. Proves you're not a Londoner, Mary said. Her proper name is Her Majesty Queen Charlotte of Great Britain, Duchess Sophia Charlotte of mecklenburg or Stretlitz. Uh, how do you remember all of those names when you can't remember one minute to do uh, to the next how much salt goes into the biscuits, Hannah asked. Biscuits are not as, as important as the queen. I practiced her name from the time she was a girl in case the day ever came when uh, when she saw me on the street and could call out her entire gracious name. If I did that, her carriage would stop and she'd make me a lady-in-waiting on account of my good manners. There was a moment of silence while the two women considered this, then a loud outburst as Anir fell over themselves in laughter. After dinner, Lady Seymour had a frightful seizure of the uh, apocalypse. Apop well, Lexi uh, she looked just like one of Ruth's fits, except not worth, or but not with so much shaking. She fell into a sleep so deep I thought that she were stone dead. But every so often she'd take a breath, and once she'd open her eyes. When we woke, or when she woke the next morning, she could not speak nor move her legs. Doctor Dusage arrived and bled her, and stuck pins in her limbs and gave her a bitter tea. In truth, there was nothing that could be done to make her better. I was told to tend to her again, as I had the right after, or as I had right after the fire. I fed her and held her teacups to her lips and wiped her chin when she dribbled and helped her with the chamber pot business. This last was the most distressing for her, and she cried when I wiped the tears from her face. Uh, I heard Madam ask the doctor plain when the old lady would die. The doctor could not answer. I figured Madam wanted Lady Seymour to die as soon as possible, but not before the Queen's ball. If the house was in mourning, it wouldn't be proper for Madam to dance with the Admiral and make Mary. A week before the ball, Madam ordered that Lady Seymour be moved to the parlor bedchamber downstairs so she could reclaim the largest bedchamber for herself. After two privates had called the lady down and uh, I carried the lady down, and she was propped up on pillows so she could look out the window, Madam called me upstairs. I want this room aired and the linens boiled, girl. It smells of decay in here. The work of the day was simple and heavy. Strip the bed, haul down the linens for the wash, clean out the hearth, open up the windows, wash them inside and out, take the rugs down, beat them in the yard, sweep and mop the floor, take the rugs back in, close the windows, and give all the wood a polish. When the chamber was clean, Madam told me to open the windows again and let them sta stand open all afternoon to make sure there was no lingering pestilence in the air. I did as I was told. The doctor came right back before supper and gave Lady Seymour a potion that would make the night pass quickly for her. When she was ready for bed, Madam called for me to bring the warming pan filled with coals and run it between the sheets because they were chilled and a wee bit damp. I did as she asked when I re or when 
then returned to the kitchen, dumped the coals into the hearth, and crept under my own blanket. She called for me again. The sheets were still too cold for her liking. I refilled the warming pan and carried it upstairs and warmed her bed. Then I stoked the fire in her hearth before returning down the stairs. The third time she called for me, I was sore tempted to dump the whole glowing coals into her bed, let it blaze, and ask her if that was warm enough. But I did not. I performed the task she gave me, and when she called a quarter hour later, I did it again. The sun rose bright the next day, catching in the icicles that hung from the eaves and jumping off the snow like a mirror. The linens pegged out on the line were froze stiff as, as wood covered in the lacework of ice. The clouds scuttled away and the sun blazed, turning the yard into a garden of jewels. Ruth would love this. If we were free and at home in Rhode Island, these uh, these were our sheets, our laundry lines, our snow. She danced like an angel. The pictures in my brain pan caught me by surprise. I could not clear uh, clear them away. She clapped her hands at the sight of the frozen laundry. She twirled in the spinning swirls of the snow that lifted in the breeze. She'd plunge her hands into the bushes to pluck off the diamonds. She would do all these things and laugh. And the wind tossed a handful of snow in my face and washed it all away. Ruth would not see this. Never. I dried my face. Why was I thinking of Ruth? I'd worked hard to pack her away from my mind, along with all the thoughts of Mama and Papa, and the life Ruth and I were promised. Didn't help to ponder things that were forever gone. It only made my body restless and fill up with bees, all wanting to sting something. I kicked... Uh, I kicked at the new snow. It rose up in a sparkling diamond, breeze fit for a queen. Twas Lady Seymour who did it, with her begging forgiveness for not buying me uh, and telling me I'd had been a good slave to her. Her with the wet eyes and the skeleton hands. Did she ever think about setting me free? That would be a fine question to ask. Of course, there's no sense in asking it because her mouth didn't work anymore. I carried the big laundry basket out to the sheets. I'd have to hang them in the kitchen else they wouldn't dry until spring another picture hung itself in my mind the poetry book on the stationer's shop the one i'd been afraid to read miss phyllis wheatley went free from her master uh, went free when her master released her twas on uh, twas on account of her fame mama said master wheatley looked the fool for keeping a po uh, poetic genius enslaved in his household I heard of other slaves who bought their freedom, folks who were given their Sunday afternoons to work for themselves, who saved their pennies and um, farthings for years and years until they had piled up a hundred or fifty or two hundred pounds to buy their whole body and soul from their master. If I had Sunday afternoons free, I'd figure out a way to earn my pennies. I could sew and hire out to scrub stables. I'd even clean out the cells at the bridewell, uh, like that guard asked. I took a long stick from the pile of kindling wood. It would never happen. Madam would not allow it. She was set on keeping my arms and my legs dancing to her tune and my soul bound in her chains. I pulled the stick back and cracked it against the side of the frozen bed linen. The ice shattered and fell to the ground, tinkling, er, uh, tinkling like pieces of fallen stars.